I had a lot of abuse when I was younger. But I think safety and security is the biggest thing. You having to have somebody there that has got your back. So when somebody doesn't give you that, it's a game changer. Food become my addiction. I fed myself with food to protect myself, to keep myself safe, to comfort myself. For where we are, the doctor's just trying to shove a tablet down your throat to cure the symptom and not deal with the problem. And at that time, I was having meltdown after meltdown. I used to be on 252 tablets a week and I stopped overnight. I just instantly become calmer and I've started to lose weight as well. Welcome to Cosmic Chats. We have the wonderful Becky Bell from the Midlands in England, that's the UK, and she is an energetic channeler. But today she's opened up and talked about having had abuse as a child, leading into food addiction, heavy medication, and how through Vedic meditation, she's been able to not only get off most of the medication, but heal some of those deep wounds and begin to finally live her own authentic life. So let's get to the first question. How would you describe the taste of a banana to someone who's never eaten one? Mm, the taste of a banana, I would describe it as soft but firm, kind of furry on the tongue, sweet, but also sour as well, depending on how ripe or unripe the banana is. Do you like bananas? You no, know I do like bananas. I find um, a lot of people can be funny about bananas. They like banana taste and things, but they don't like a banana because of the texture. I find that quite a lot. It is a texture element. Everyone has talked about that. Yeah. So uh, tell me about your first existential life crisis as a child. Oh, um, I would imagine going back, I've had quite a few to be fair, but I think the one that comes to me the most is when I was about six or seven years old, just really starting to look and understand that something isn't right. You know, when I'm looking at people's behaviour, people's attitudes and actually starting to question why somebody's reacted a certain way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Was there a triggering event? <clears throat> I had a lot of abuse when I was younger. I went through a lot of abuse, which I don't mind um, going into. I've got nothing to be ashamed of. And looking at other people's responses, like how people react and respond, I even to this day, I'm still working through it, just looking at how people react to you when they find out certain information, um, and even not even just to do with abuse, even things that go on I mean, at school and when you you say something or you stand up to somebody or you're in any kind of abuse or bullying, looking at how adults handle that situation was quite a trigger for me. And because something just never quite fit. And I've noticed it a lot growing up and it's something I'm still working on now. Definitely. It's that kind of reaction and re reacting and responding element. I think that brings it about. And I've gone through it quite a lot. And I find it very, very, very interesting. But obviously, or I say obviously, people only react and respond to the knowledge that they have, their life experiences, their consciousness, their wisdom, their evolution. So when you were younger and you noticed this, was there a disappointment element that you had expected uh, certain adults to support you with and you got an adverse yeah. reaction? Yeah, it was very much, why hasn't somebody stood up for me or backed me up or even not even for myself, but other people. I'd see certain people being treated a certain way or, and I think, why hasn't that person stood up for them? Why haven't they backed them up? And the other thing is criticising and judgment. I would see that a lot in people, even in my own family. And I'd never understand why do you feel the need to criticise that person or to judge that person? What makes you, um, what makes it okay for you to be able to treat somebody else like that? I see that a lot. And so when you had that disappointment with that adult, 
did you go to a second source and experience the same reaction or it was completely different? Sometimes it was a different reaction, depends on which, depends on what the incident was. But when I'm thinking of the incident that I'm talking about at the moment, I went to a different adult and they had a completely different reaction. But then I think that makes you, I'm not sure if that's more disappointing or whether it makes you more confused because everyone seemed to have probably like five or six people we talked about at that time. Everybody had a different reaction and trying to understand that process is hard, especially when you're a child. So some of the people you went to, you had a relationship where you trusted them more. Yeah. And did you find in this situation, the ones that you trusted more seemed to be not responding in a way that you had hoped? Yeah. Yes, definitely. But then also expectations. But I think as a child, it's hard to have an expectation of what you should or shouldn't expect. But I think safety and security is the biggest thing. You, having to have somebody there that has got your back that stands up for you that protects you that's something that i think you need innately within you to feel safe so when somebody doesn't give you that it's a game changer and then what happened they didn't give you safety that you had hoped for or expected what then how did you then respond did you shut down did you find somewhere else to, to go I went off the rails. <laughs> I went off the rails a bit. I um, bad behaviour, the way I treated myself, the way I treated other people, attitude, just kind of, yeah. I when I say went off the rails, we're talking thirty something years ago. So I think nowadays, do you know what I mean? Going off the rails is something completely different. But my attitude, how I responded, how I looked after myself, food become my addiction. I fed myself with food to protect myself, to keep myself safe, to comfort myself. And yeah, because I didn't get that where, where I needed it. And with this, did you then find, as you'd worked through the abuse, that the food addiction was now a habit? Yes, it does. It becomes a habit. And... I've gone into, I've studied addiction and I've looked into it a lot myself because I've been on a journey of self-healing for a long time, but lots of different ways and methods as we all do to try and find something that's right for us, don't we? Um, but yeah, food is a hard one because I've kind of gone down the rails of like drugs and alcohol and sex and everything, but I never, I never went off the rails completely. I just kind of like, I don't know what I mean, stuck my toe in that kind of area. But food, I find it's a hard one because we need food to survive. We need food to survive. And for so many of us, we've grown up in this world of not even understanding quality of food, what's good, what's bad, portion size. I mean, the amount of people that I know that are my age that have grown up with a literally sugary cereal for breakfast, a cheese sandwich for lunch and something out of the freezer for dinner. It's just not even really acceptable nowadays, is it? <laughs> right, but yes. The food become the comfort. So it wasn't just what I was eating, it was when. And, and then it did just turn into a habit. Bad food become comforting. But I'm learning and realising now, salt, oil, sugar. <laughs> um, but it's hard, yeah. It becomes a habit. The comfort becomes a habit and it's a hard thing to break. A very, very hard thing to break. Because you're, for me, I'm 42. So I think I'm changing 42 years of the way I've been eating. What I've been taught is normal or okay. I'm having to relearn and, yeah, destroy the habit and relearn a new one. But it's so hard when it's a mental and physical thing. Yeah, that's imprinted in the nervous system very young. So uh, the, the self-talk is uh, not driving the change of habit. That The self-talk is the conscious mind. We're dealing with the subconscious that runs all of the habit. When did you become aware that 
there was an action or actions that you wanted to change in your life? Oh. I think I've had a few. I've had a few. You know, like small things that have come up where I, I want to change. You know where you get an epiphany? And I'm like, I need to change something, but it's the actual sticking to it. But I believe three years ago, I decided something happened and I had this feeling and I wanted to move to Australia. And it's still on my goal to move to Australia. Obviously, with the world the way it is at the moment, it's not acceptable. But I wanted to move and I wanted it. When I was 13, somebody hugged me and I felt safe for the first time in my life. And... Oh, I'm going to tear up. Three years ago, I saw something and it was about life in Australia. Mm. And I got the same feeling I had when I was 13. And I realised that I didn't want to just move because the grass is green on the other side. I needed to change. Not because I want to change me, but I need to let go of everything and move forward and become the person that I just am without all the add-ons. And that is food included mentally emotionally spiritually and sexually well, when did you start to make headway in regards to the food probably three years ago i've always made little bits of headway throughout life as you learn and you just grow older and, and as you learn but realizing the impact it's had on my body how not just how overweight i am but how much medical stuff i've got so much going wrong with me medically mm. I just realized if I want to live this dream and I want to be happy I needed to start working on myself and food is a massive part of that but it's a mental emotional and physical thing isn't it so what steps have you taken that you found that have helped you <clears throat> putting myself first is the first thing <laughs> really understanding what holding space for yourself means and when I had this idea of moving to Australia, it was literally two weeks after I discovered Vedic meditation. So it literally happened within a couple of weeks of each other. And the meditation has given me the capacity to have more space to be able to understand more about what's going on. And now I've been able to take help to get the type of help and therapy that I need because everybody needs a different type of help and therapy, don't they? What's right for one person is not right for the next. Different learning more about nutrition and having a different nutritionist, speaking to different doctors. And yeah, I'm kind of loving the journey now. I'm like I'm grateful for what I've been through so that I can let go and move forward as you become more into the flow of things. I'm kind of grateful for where I've been so I can help with this. What were the marking points that you noticed with Vedic meditation that made a big difference for you? When I actually learned, the weekend I actually learned, I did it on a retreat for a weekend, I went away. And I just instantly become calmer. Instantly. It was an instant thing. But I just become calmer and I come home calmer. And at that time, I was having meltdown after meltdown i used to be on 252 tablets a week and i stopped overnight which wasn't the right thing to do but i wanted to be better and i just thought i'm just going to stop this and what kind of tablets were they if you don't mind different types of painkillers steroids anti-inflammatories antidepressants hormonal stuff plus on top of that um Diabetes medication, insulin, lots okay. and lots of morphine. And what age was this? this? This is literally three years ago. So three years ago in January. And I came off it all. So I was ha constantly having meltdowns where I was coming off the medication, but I was doing the meditation at the same time. So now I look back and I actually realised I was releasing as well. I was building up that stress and I was releasing it. And I can clearly see markers over the last three years where I've been building up the stress and the meditation has helped release that. 
but I never ca- I never would catch it until afterwards. Do you know what I mean? I might be releasing something or going through something, and I realise afterwards the process of what's happened. But now I'm like three years into it, I catch it at the time. As I'm going, I'm just in the ebb. That's fine. I'm just in the ebb. Release it. Hold space for myself. <laughs> Work out what's going on. Why? Let go. Move forward. Now immediately when it you felt calmer, so that's reducing into the the sympathetic to the parasympathetic, which is also the fight or flight response to the relaxation state. And then over time with the regular practice, as that was then normalized, the nervous system, then one was able to perceive where the upswing or downswing stress is is coming. And rather than sort of play catch up to feel calmer, then it moves into adapting when it happens. And then the foresight, right, feeling it's coming on, um, being able to adapt and maybe, I don't know, having that second meditation a little sooner to help that nervous system go in. There are once learned with the practice, there are ways to assist. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we're talking about Vedic meditation. And if you're curious, we have a free ebook if you have Amazon Unlimited Prime, or if not, super, super cheap. And it has stories from people who let the practice and it changed their lives. It's called Vedic Meditation Stories. The link is down below and any profits go to proceeds, sorry, go towards the nonprofit to bring meditation in large numbers, ideally to underrepresented groups who would not normally be able to get access to the self-sufficient technique that Becky is talking about that get learned over a four sessions, ideally in a follow-up program for the rest of your life. So that practice, definitely within the three years, you've noticed how it's absolutely done what they said. You initially takes the stress out, you feel calmer, and then the brain is able to cognize or have better perception in discerning capabilities. Now, although you chose to go off of your tablets, uh, and usually we would recommend people to, you know, work with a doctor. Get a doctor, yeah. (laughs) With it. what did you find was happening as you continue to do the meditation practice? I become more conscious and more aware of myself and, and other people. But something I will say is in the last three years, I have stopped the meditation practice two or three times. And it's been for two or three weeks. And it's usually been because I've been on holiday with somebody and they don't understand why I want to get up. And I'm like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll just do it when I get back off holiday or... Do you know what I mean? Or something's happened and I've not been in the right place or I've been poorly. And then afterwards, I'm like, oh, if I'd have just meditated through that, I would have I would have got better quicker. Yes, you know, yes, like absolutely. And that, that's and, human nature, right? And we all know this as, as a teacher, you know, they're imparting to people how to keep it going and how to yeah. deal with the practicality of it or, you know, having family or friends who often feel a sense of abandonment just for 20 minutes, like really um, doing that. But everyone understands having that, oh, I just need a little break or I need some quiet time. That's a magic phrase to use. But it's really, like you say, putting one's self-care first. And that is basic nourishment, water, sleep, um, and keeping the meditation up there. But you've had that experience. You've had that experience where you've sort of gone off the wagon, as it were, And no, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And that's coming back to that, which can be hard because there is this self, the shame, which is around a lot of individuals who've experienced abuse uh, in matters that seemingly there ought not to be shame, but that's part of the abuse imprint, right? And so putting yourself first in doing that. And that's why there is a lifetime follow-up of being able to dial into group meditations. That's why you can re-sit in on the course as a refresher because we're human beings and and it's it's all part of the course. So <laughs> you learned that you would uh, feel better if you kept going. Now, medication-wise, are you still off of most of that medicine? I'm on, the only medication I'm on at the moment is my diabetic medication. So I've come off everything else and I actually feel better for it. A lot of the um, medical problems I had have actually started to drop away since coming off the medication. So I've been doing a lot of research because I'm kind of, 
I know every country and every place is different, but for where we are, the doctors just try and shove a tablet down your throat to cure the symptom and not deal with the problem. And this is something I've been working on a lot the last couple of years. And I have a Vedic mentor now as well that I speak to every week. So I really, there's this difference between just giving yourself time and really making time and holding space for yourself to heal and understand. And the last, well, this year has been the most amazing year for me. And it's all just because of my meditation. I've realized so much about myself, about who I am. It's like, and I've started to lose weight as well because I'm letting go of the, what's connected, do you know what I mean? The conditioning and the habit associated. But my, <sighs> My meditation for me now is my priority in life. I wake up in the morning, I make my bed, I brush my teeth, I feed the dog and I meditate. And I meditate again in the afternoon. And sometimes I'll do an extra couple of meditations in the day or I'll do a nidra. Do you know, if I need an extra bit of peace that day, if I'm in the ebb <laughs> and I'm not coping. Or, but now I look forward to the ebb and the flow. Because when I'm in that ebb, I'm learning something, I'm understanding, and I'm letting go. And everybody that comes to see me as a client, my first thing is I always recommend you learn to meditate. I recommend and when they ask you, when you, you give that recommendation, I'm sure you get a lot of nods. Or yeah. when people ask why, what do you say to them? <clears throat> I usually say to them, I just give them a snippet of how I used to be. Do you know what I mean? So up and down and having meltdowns. And at the point where I could barely walk, I used to be in so much pain, I could barely walk and just my life. Um, but it's about having quality of life and holding time for yourself. And I kind of always explain it that when we learn to meditate, just general meditation, where if this is our body and we're full of stress and trauma and grief and all the the stuff that we go through in life, meditation is like calming it down. But when we're doing the Vedic meditation, the transcendental meditation, we're releasing it. And that's kind of how I explain it. Instead of just calming it down, we're releasing you know, all this stuff in our lifetime, previous lifetimes. And I've got a good 20 friends and clients that are, have started on the One Giant Minds app, actually, and, a lot of, and or are going into Vedic meditation as we speak. My favourite one was about two weeks ago when my clients had turned around to me and said, I've got so much more clarity. I'm like, oh, that's strange, isn't it? Right. <laughs> You've been and meditating. Yeah, and, and, and so those are people who are completely new. Again, there is the ebook, uh, But basically, the meditation comes in two forms, conscious mind and non-directive practices. And conscious mind is what we all see here on YouTube and people can uh, uh, listen to something, follow a direction. And this is perfect and brilliant for the waking state. The unconscious, the non-directive practices uh, go in in spite of yourself and yeah. it gets that nervous system. So if you have a nervous system like you in uh, childhood PTSD or PTSD, there's a programming in there to go to fight or flight to protect you. And then there's a point where the mind knows that what is happening reaction wise is not protective it's actually creating a cycle but breaking that cycle and if you see other forms of addiction you know people will say our oh, 12-step programs don't work blah 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 this doesn't work that's because the individual consciousness of that person breaking that cycle is run by that subconscious right and and there can be support systems absolutely very helpful but how do you get down deep to that stress to change it and a lot of that stress is ready to come up and out especially if there has been conscious mind work on oneself right whether it's therapy or uh i just say that in a word all kinds of therapy right yeah. but the body doesn't get to a place where it's at a state where when we do vedic meditation we sit comfortably with the eyes closed but the body is sitting upright and this means that chemicals have not been released to go to sleep such as lying down and so when the mind settles down by this charming sound the body follows but the body recognizes it's not actually going to sleep it goes into this different state of consciousness where it's ready to throw off these memories these patterns this programming that hasn't had an opportunity to come up and out 
And that's where this difference is. When that is coming up and out of the body, the body is behind the mind. The body remembers all of these things that happened, right? It's like body language is often watched by individuals or, you know, it's level, isn't it? right, right. It goes down deep. And so when the body can actually release that stress out because the mind is being charmed in, what then happens is when we come back up to the surface in a waking state, there is more freedom now. There's more um, elasticity. There's more malleability, right? Which is why people find themselves feeling lighter because they literally have released something that was ready to come up and out. And then that means the mind is clearer because there's less of these patterns that are holding us to protect us that we don't need anymore. Again, these are ones that we are ready to let go of. So the mind can be clearer in the present moment because at any moment we can get triggered by something we don't know we don't know we have, right? And so over time, when there is a regular practice of meditation, you know, 20 minutes, twice a day, let's say, the imprint on that nervous system is now giving it that space. And the more you have that space, the more a habit is formed, oh, I can let this go. So rather than simply feeling as calm for a weekend and then coming back to your life, what then happens is as the day goes on, that stress is moved up and out because there's space for it to move. And then the brain is able to come online because the nervous system is less, as I like to say, tweaked, as it were. Yeah. And a big, big part of any form of addiction, one, of course, is the habit, but two, the underlying issues is you need something to replace so that nervous system. If it's used to being anxious, if it's used to being at fight or flight, that's a habit now. And so it doesn't feel normal to not be in that state. Yeah, of course. And so this is why we have individuals that recreate drama, right? Because that feels yes. normal right yeah so, it, it, it's normal to them isn't it absolutely and all of ourselves we all came to meditation for a reason and if you are watching this and you feel like oh well i don't think i need that i don't have any of these addiction issues well come from charm rather than aversion and be better than us <laughs> <laughs> definitely so if you were to go back and talk to your six-year-old self and say yeah. some words of encouragement or uh, advice what would you say I would, I would tell my six-year-old self to listen and believe to my in myself, and not necessarily listen and believe everybody else. Because I always had that innate sense that I knew what was right or wrong, or what was good or bad, or even if it's just lis listening to somebody's reaction or watching somebody's reaction, to know that it doesn't have to be that way, or that there's more. Um, because we just, we're going to grow up in a world full of conditioning. People telling you what they think you should do. And especially in the last 30 years, we've grown up in a world of, we've grown up in a world of social media. I would tell my six year old self to just stay with me, literally, to do what is right and hold space for me. And to, uh, I suppose to grow up or try and grow up with the ability of not taking on everybody else's woes and anxiousness and stresses and worries. Because sometimes so much of what we hold is because of other people. It's in our imprint, isn't it? How we see other people behave, react, and it becomes part of our conditioning. So I tell my six-year-old, to go with what I think is right and just to not soak in <clears throat> the energy from other people. And those of you who are curious about how is a child going to do that? Well, those who practice meditation, who are parental figures, like me, guardian, or someone who's raising a child, yeah. as when they practice, the children can learn a special children's technique at no financial cost and their children can practice being able to process their emotions process what's going on get that nervous system with that deep rest sooner than later and the result is that their own intuition is stronger and guided and there is awareness of obviously as a child we need to rely on adults for support but being able to find a way to navigate that and having that clarity. And if we want to look at someone who has huge capacity to do that at a young age, 
is uh, Greta and what she's been doing for the world to wake up. So don't ever think that a child doesn't have power and yeah. uh, w is not going to be heard, but it can be done. And I think perhaps if we were listening a little bit more uh, to the wisdom of our yeah. youngsters, we may have a different world. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Those of you Bye. who want to know Bye. more about her, we I'm so grateful for your honest uh uh, candor of what's been happening with you all of the links are down in the description box below and we hope that you will like and subscribe and let us know what you thought of our chat today thank you again for joining us